the National Archives is a state institution and we hold the records of the Irish state, but also we hold historical records. If you think that the state was formed in 1922, we have all of the records for those intervening 100 years. So we tell the story really of Ireland in terms of its development, culturally, socially, politically, historically. The National Archives is the successor body of two predecessor institutions. The Public Record Office of Ireland, which was established in 1867, based over in the Four Courts complex, and the State Paper Office of Ireland, which functioned out of Dublin Castle and which was established in 1702. Then in 1922, due to explosions in the Four Courts complex, much of the holdings in the Public Record Office of Ireland were destroyed, primarily uh, medieval and early modern records. So from 1922 onwards from the foundation of the state, the 1920s and 30s were really spent trying to come to terms with the loss of such a huge quantity of, of records and in effect Ireland's documentary heritage. Both the SPO and the PRO continued as separate entities up until the National Archives Act of 1986, which created the National Archives, which um, took on or absorbed the functions of the two predecessor bodies. So in the early 1990s, the National Archives moved from the Public Record Office in the Four Courts over to our current premises here in Bishop Street, which was the old Jacob's Biscuit Factory. We have all of the foundation documents from the early days of the establishment of the state. So in the safe downstairs we have the 1921 treaty. But then go forward to 1998 and we have Good Friday Agreement. In a way we're telling a hundred years of a story and we're privileged in the National Archives that actually we look after those precious, precious documents on behalf of the Irish state. Under our foundation legislation, the National Archives Act of 1986, we are legally mandated to acquire the records of departments uh, once they become 30 years old and to make them available for inspection by the public. Uh, at the end of every year, uh, records are transferred by government departments to the National Archives. They are listed in an electronic catalogue. The catalogue is made available to search on our website and the records themselves which are housed or rehoused in asset-free folders and uh, boxes are then made available for consultation by the public in early January the following year and they become part of the official record of state. So one of the biggest projects we ever did was to digitise the 1911 census and that was a really, really important uh, project for us because it expanded and developed our genealogical service. People from all over the world now don't have to physically come to the National Archives to access their family histories or to begin to understand where they came from and to find out those stories. They can actually do it sitting in the comfort of their own home online. We also then obviously have a genealogy service here so people can come into the National Archives and they will work with the genealogist to better understand it, to find records that can trace their ancestral past. We have a very wide ranging education and outreach programme which encompasses tours of the building, presentations, going outside of the building to give talks to external groups, engaging with organisations such as local history societies, communities, schools, universities, and through participation in national and international conferences and also through key collaborations with sister institutions and initiatives. Examples of those would of course be Culture Night, Crinion and Oog, Heritage Week, Back to Our Past and, and so on. For the National Archives we're coming into a really exciting period because we hold the foundation documents for the state and we're coming into 100 years since the foundation of the state. We're going to develop an exhibition as part of the National Commemorations Programme but we will also be commemorating 100 years since the destruction of the old Public Record Office. So we're working with multiple partners, we're working specifically with Trinity College Dublin and with our colleagues in Northern Ireland in the Public Record Office there to actually reconstruct digitally uh, the Public Record Office as it was in 1921 
on the site of the forecourt. And the major project that we have that will be unveiled in June of 2022 will be a new repository. So the state have actually invested millions in building a state-of-the-art new repository that will ensure that we can continue in our role to safeguard the records of the state. Our collections are, are very exciting. The National Archives holds an immense trove of records. There is no end to the discoveries and the surprises that you might make in delving in to the holdings that we have and we are here to help you make them. So the National Archives as we are now, we were formed in 1986 under legislation and then this building was given to us in 1988 by the state. Albeit that we had been collecting records as the old public record office, we became the National Archives. In 1922, when the old public record office was destroyed, we lost centuries of records. And in a way, that moment marked a new beginning for the state, but also for the National Archives, because we started a new journey, which was to collect the records of the modern Irish state. And there was an absolute commitment um, in the Free State Government to ensure that that process of collecting the records of the state and telling that story would be enshrined almost in what we did. I manage the digital imaging unit, which we create all copies of documents that are requested by the public. And we also do preservation copying, which is where we would copy an entire series of records for preservation purposes. We look at records that are of national interest and records that we know are going to be very popular with the public. So the classic example, obviously, are the 1901 and the 1911 census. A lot of work goes into digitisation and you want to make sure that the records are what people want to view and that there will be long-term use of them. In the past, archives would have microfilmed records in order to create copies, or what they would call surrogates, but now we digitise. The equipment that we have, they're all specially designed archive scanners and cameras. They're sympathetic, it's low light, low heat, so there'll be very little damage to the document by making that copy. Microfilms that were made 100 years ago can still be used, can still be read. But digital images, obviously, you can do them in colour and you can do them in high resolution. And when you get a digital copy rather than a printout, you can zoom in and you can you see the data much more clearly. The census was actually digitised from microfilm. The microfilm was done in the 1970s. However, we have digitised the soldiers' wills from the First World War. And there's over 9,000 of those records. And they're very small, fragile documents. And we knew that they would be very popular, obviously, when the centenary of the First World War was coming up. I project managed the digitisation of the soldiers' wills and to see all of them up there and out there for the public to see these wonderful collections, which are sometimes very sad because, the, you know, most of these, they were rank and file privates in, in the army. So they had the, the pay, their pay and their army pay and that's all they had. And nine times out of ten it's left to their mother or their sister or their father because obviously most of them were young unmarried men. We had a gentleman from Belfast, and um, one of the wills that we used, as, you know, we, we took out, we highlighted some wills uh, when we launched them, and one of the wills we had was signed with an X, because the, the person couldn't sign, and it turned out to be his grandfather. I met the gentleman, he came down, and he, and he saw the will, so it was great that for a family member that they were able to see their relative, um, and to see, to see his will. You're able to bring people to life, you're able to see a bit more of their story, and a bit more of how they lived and where they lived. We are based here obviously in Bishop Street and we still have our storage in the forecourt complex where the original public record office was. The building was rebuilt after the destruction in the Civil War in 1922 but it was half the size of the original building. But there's about 90,000 standard archive boxes in the forecourts and here in Bishop Street we would have about 200,000 archive boxes here. We also have records in commercial off-site storage. We have tens of millions of documents and an archival record can be a single sheet this size. It can be a photograph from the 19th century that's this size or it can be a massive volume from the 18th century, 19th century that's this big. It's stock control for records on a massive scale. 
We store documents in the most sympathetic way because obviously the aim is to preserve these documents as long as humanly possible. In an archive you want cool and dry, so the lights are on sensors, so it's dark in here unless there's somebody in here. We never turn on the heating. This isn't a purpose-built archive building and it does have windows, so we've put UV filters on the windows and we've put blinds on all the windows. We do have an electronic monitoring system which monitors temperature and humidity at all times so that we can see if there are any issues in any areas. Security is very important here and we have 24-hour security on site and readers who come in, obviously they're not able to bring their bags or their, their pens or anything like that. We do everything we can to protect the documents. Although this isn't a purpose-built archive, we do everything we can to meet international standards for archive buildings to ensure the protection and the long-term preservation of the documents. In the, the 19th century, every, when the national schools were established, they applied to the then Board of Education to set up a school in their area, and so there's uh, records for every county, and we're currently digitising those. It's a huge collection and it's taking quite a bit of time, but we're really excited to get that done because obviously it's full of lots of local information about the schools in the areas, and for schools themselves, if they want to do school histories and commemorations for the opening of their school, they'll be able to use that information as well. The National Archives is the record keeper of government of the state. All records that are created in an official capacity by civil and public servants, they come to the National Archives. It is wonderful to see records go up online and that people anywhere in the world at any time of the day can view one of our documents. The role of conservation within the National Archives runs the gamut of preserving and that's where we look at our storage and our environment and we look at how we hold things here in the building but also it runs through from the very simple processes of perhaps just cleaning something to doing full and very complicated conservation treatments such as humidification, flattening and repair work um, and so a conservator can give advice but also do all those jobs as well. We work really closely with the archivists in the sense of they're the ones who are organising and making sure that everything's here, that everything's listed, that everything can be found, but that they will come to me in terms of seeking advice for what's best for storage or if somebody wants to see something, requesting how to use it and how to handle it. Unfortunately, we haven't got the resources to conserve absolutely everything that we hold here because it's millions of documents but what we will do is try and facilitate as best we can the researchers requests and sometimes the archivist will come to me and we'll find short-term solutions whether that's even just putting something in a folder or in a plastic museum grade wallet so that it can be accessed and still looked at in the reading room so we try our best not to slow down any research um, but there are times where conservation does have to get in and do the work and to conserve the documents before they can actually be used and accessed. There are probably three key roles that we have when it comes to looking after both individual documents and larger collections um, and they would involve surface cleaning. Surface cleaning is the removal of dirt and dust from the surface of the document to make sure that the text is legible, that somebody can see it. Also it makes it more pleasant for people to handle the documents. It also reduces the chance of that dirt being transferred from one document to another. The next thing I suppose we do a lot of times is we're repairing damage. Physical damage is if things have been torn, literally by overhandling, by overuse or by mishandling, and so we can repair that damage too. And then I suppose the third key thing we do is about removing creases and crumples and tears and getting things flat so that people can see them and appreciate them and get all the information that they can from them. Conservators in, in the West have tended to look to Japanese techniques both because they have a huge history, a very long history of hand making paper and the handmade paper tends to be long fibred and conservators favour long fibred papers because when you tear it, it leaves little fibrils that will actually adhere to your document quite easily. But there are some excellent Western papers that can be made as well and can be used in conservation. So it's a combination of both. I suppose the knowledge of a conservator is what paper will work best with what document that you're trying to repair because we can be working on something that can be um, a piece of parchment from the 14th century right through to a document that was created 30 years ago. One technique that I would use a lot, um, especially if I'm working on parchment, which is animal skin, is humidification and for that I use an ultrasonic humidifier which turns water into a very fine cool fog and I place it within a humidity chamber, a large dome, which looks a bit like an incubator, and very slowly the moisture goes into the parchment and rehydrates the skin, which means that it becomes soft and more flexible, which allows me to work with it and, and let me reshape it so that the distortions that you see 
um, can be removed and we can end up with a document that is flat. That means if it's going to be digitised, it means for image capture it's easier for the digitisation team to do that or if it's going to be used by a researcher it's also easier for them to look at and read the document. What we're very conscious of is using materials and tools that won't do any damage to the documents. The tools that I use to surface clean, the erasers that I use, and whilst they lift up the particles of dust and dirt that are sitting on the paper surface, they don't do any damage to that surface. When I look at a document, I'm looking at how it was made, I'm looking at the materials used to make it, what inks were used, what was it written on, how was it printed. I, I leave the history to the archivists and the historians, and there's a real thrill in that, in the sense of, doing my conservation work and then handing it on to an archivist or a historian and then seeing what they come back with and seeing their excitement and their pleasure and that very much happens as well when you deal with the general public when you can make something available to them and they get a kick out of what they see. Because this collection is the nation's collection it is something that belongs to everybody. We actually all are invested in the National Archives and what we hold here. Some of the earliest documents that we have here go back to the 1300s and they have a really interesting history both in terms of how old they are but also in terms of how they survived a fire in 1922. Well in the immediate aftermath of the explosion in um, June, 30th of June 1922, heroic efforts were made by the staff of the Public Record Office to salvage whatever records they could and that often involved taking charred documents putting them in boxes, wrapping them up in parcels, tying them with a string in the hope that they would be able to save as much as they possibly could. And certainly the archivists and record keepers would have done their best to salvage what they could, but the depth of destruction was, was quite considerable. Certainly with the advance in technology, the National Archives has embarked on a conservation project to literally open up the boxes and untie the parcels of material uh, almost 100 years later to see what is there, to see what can be salvaged, what can be conserved and ultimately what can be digitised uh, for, for, for posterity. Working with archival partners, um, we can start exploring the, um, the possibilities of using extraordinary conservation techniques and science to help go beyond what I can do at the conservation bench and actually explore alternative means for finding out and retrieving information. And it is all about the retrieval of information. And so that's really exciting and that's something we're really looking forward to being involved with over the next few years. I suppose I've been a conservator now for, oh, for nearly 30 years and I know that I've seen some things and I've held things up close that people will never get to see the way I have. I love what I do, I love walking into this place every morning. The satisfaction of taking something that is a scrunched up bundle that looks like there's nothing much there and transforming that into a flat document. I haven't heard of it yet and I don't think I will. We have to remember that what we do now, we're leaving behind the legacy to make sure that people can still research their history. The more we know about our history, the better understanding we have of us as a people. And I think conservators, it's not just the intricate work that we do at the bench, it's about making sure that collections as a whole are looked after, but also that they're appreciated, that they're used and that they're accessible. Um, and I think that's the really important and exciting role of conservation. So the National Archives is open to the public five days a week. People can either drop in off the street or they can make an appointment, apply for a reader's ticket and come and use the records of the National Archives. We're so used to thinking about somewhere like the National Archives being about historians or researchers or citizen researchers, but actually anybody can come not only to find historical records, but it could be to find out more about your family history. All of those records are here, and all we want to do is share them with the Irish public. The Reading Room is a place where members of the public can come and consult records. Technological developments have meant that people can look at a lot of material at home as well. There are databases that are searchable on our website, but most of the older records 
can only be examined by a researcher actually coming in here. They'd go down uh, to the foyer downstairs and, and uh, the person on duty at the counter would give them an application form. They'd come up here to the reading room and go to the counter with uh, their application. They'd get a little uh, reader's ticket and one of the productions and return staff then goes downstairs and gets the particular file that the person is interested in. Some of our documents are an off-site storage, you know, but there's a facility on our website where people can order these in advance. If people wish to do a, a copy of a file that they're looking at, they, they can fill in a little application form for permission to do that with their phone. And uh, if they need to order photocopies, they can do that as well. There are various other facilities here. There are microfilm readers, there are computer terminals as well. Our staff will assist people by showing them how to actually use the machines. An important element of the National Archives Act was it ensured the preservation of departmental records. I suppose there's a common perception due to the destruction of the Public Record Office in 1922 that very little before that survives. But that's not the case, in fact. We have hundreds of thousands of documents relating to various aspects of life here in Ireland. A lot of the Chief Secretary's office, the Dublin Castle material, relates to law and order. Dublin Castle, they were very concerned about popular movements in the 19th century. So there's a great material on political subversion, right, going right back to 1798. The, the 1848 re rebellion and the people associated with it, the, the Fenian troubles in the 1860s, the land war in the 1880s. So there's a, there, there's a, a great um, mass of material there. And of course, a lot of that material, it's coming from the government side, you know, and you're getting the government view of things, but, but often uh, within it, uh, there are things like um, threatening letters or uh, uh, you know subversive notices you know that, that that give an insight into the other side you've uh, a great sense that uh, sections of the population you know over a long long time you know we're at odds with the existing order you know and and, and it helps you understand why things like the, the, the war of independence actually happened or succeeded you know you know, the smallest amount of information can be of great interest. You realise the worth of the records that you've been working with. There was a, a place called the Dublin Union. It was a successor to the South Dublin Union Workhouse. And we have uh, the registers go up to 1938. And I, I, rem I remember one instance, um, the register proved that the birth mother had remained in the institution with her son. Uh, up, and, up until that, the, the, the time that that son was fostered out and it was a great comfort for him to know that his mother had been with him for the couple of uh, the first year, uh, two years of his life, you know. So, so even that fragmentary information, you know, can, can uh, be of great significance to somebody. In a lot of my time as an archivist here, I, I, I was out getting records in, you know, from various places. Things like, you know, registers of hospitals before 1901, you know, there are no complete census returns or, or uh, workhouse registers, you know. Often these are quite poor people who wouldn't be mentioned in any other records. And, and the, these registers actually are proof that, that, you know, that, they, that they existed, you know, and, and, and reflect par part of their life. And they're incredibly, incredibly precious, incredibly precious records. The National Archives is a public resource. It's a cultural institution that was created for and on behalf of the people of Ireland to ensure that we conserve and preserve the records of Ireland. But it is our responsibility to ensure that we can reach as broad a public as possible in terms of ensuring that they can come and access our, our documents and our records. So it's freely available and anybody can use it. It's our privilege really to safeguard the memory of the state in the state's records and then to be able to share that with people who, who are interested either coming here or finding um, our records online. So genealogy is the study of family history. It is finding out who your ancestors were and documenting each generation working back to the earliest that you can find. It starts out, I think, just a curiosity to find out where you came from. And then, of course, for some people, it just becomes a bit of an obsession. You know, once you find two grandparents and then it's 
a couple of great grandparents and you keep going back and you just want to keep filling in and finding out who all of these people were. It certainly appeals to the detective in people. So the National Archives Genealogy Advisory Service is staffed by a panel of professional, experienced genealogists. So we've been doing this for a long time and we can really take on a range of different queries. So we can help you decide where to go, where to start looking, how to look, that method of research and help you be sort of efficient and make sure you've found the right people and where to go to keep looking for more information about your ancestors. It's also entirely free, so there is no cost involved. And as I said, so many records are also entirely freely available online. For most people, the first place to start is actually talk to your family. And, you know, if you can, if there are people still around that would have that knowledge, and just start gathering what they know. We would advise them to work methodically back through each generation because it's too easy sometimes to maybe pick up the wrong person and you could spend a year researching somebody else's family uh, missing out on your own. Births, deaths and marriages, for example, which is the bread and butter and, and really the starting point for Irish genealogy, contains so much detail. Get the original certificate because it's going to tell you what occupation the father of the child had, what address the family lived at, who the person was that registered the birth, which may have been an aunt or a grandmother. Um, all of these little details are really important in painting a picture of who your ancestors were. So the 1901 and the 1911 census, again, freely available online on the website of the National Archives of Ireland, will tell you people's occupations, their religion, their literacy, their marital status. Um, but there's also additional detail in relation to the house that they lived in. So it's going to tell you whether they lived in a two-roomed house with a thatched roof, um, but 12 people lived in the house together, or a tenement building that's been divided up between six families and houses something like 50 people. So all those details, all of a sudden, you can see children running up and down the steps in a tenement building where there's maybe 12 or 14 of them from different families. And that, again, just paints the picture of, of what their life might have been like and perhaps how different it is from the lives that we live today. There have been genealogists around for a really long time and that would have been to serve the landed classes who needed to prove their sort of hereditary rights to titles. However, I think it's really the advent of the internet that has really changed genealogy, particularly Irish genealogy, because all of a sudden it's made records accessible to people all over the world. And when you consider that Ireland has this diaspora that can be found almost everywhere in the world, those people now have an opportunity to access Irish records and really start investigating their family history. The big loss, I think, for genealogists was the destruction of the 19th century census returns. So there was a census taken in Ireland every 10 years, starting in 1821. So the returns for 61, 71, 81 and 91 uh, were pulped, we believe, during the First World War because of a paper shortage. And of course, uh, what, six years later, the remaining returns, 21, 31, 41 and 51, were destroyed in, in the Public Record Office fire. So a lot of genealogy records have been made available online. 1901 and 1911 census, births, deaths and marriages, Catholic parish registers, land records and so on. There's material that was destroyed in 1922, for which we have some substitutes like wills and testamentary records. A large number of Church of Ireland records were also destroyed in 1922. They relate to sort of a much smaller proportion of the population. As your research progresses, you're probably going to find that there are other sources you want to look at, but that they're not available online. So for example, national school records are held in the National Archives of Ireland. A list of national school teachers from 1905 has recently been published online, but there's a wealth more material uh, behind that relating to the establishment of schools, the employment of teachers, and even role books for children in schools. Um, that are on site here. There's things like court records, records relating to the Ordnance Survey, and even just records relating to the administration of the state. So people who might have been employed in the civil service, employment records for them might be found here. So there's a lot more material on site. And again, that's another question that it's worth asking the genealogist or the archivist on duty as to what's here that might tell me more about my ancestor who was a policeman or who worked for customs and excise or the inland revenue or who might have been a national school teacher. The genealogists who provide this service in the National Archives are all really passionate about what they do and they get excited for you about the journey you're just about to head off on 
and are more than delighted to be able to kind of give you advice um, and assistance uh, with the records, with finding them, with interpreting them, uh, reading them. You know, there's a lot of old handwriting in there uh, that can be difficult to deal with. We've been doing it for many years and have a good eye for it generally. Um, and so any question is fine. It's an enormous jigsaw puzzle and you're slowly putting the pieces together to build up a picture of who people are. And for me, you know, holding somebody's birth certificate in my hand is when they start to come to life. Like one of my favourites is this is a, a marriage certificate that I found for a girl who was described as a wandering dairy maid. Now for me that was, whether it was true or not, this was a young woman wandering the countryside with two milk pails in her hand who stumbled across a fine young man. For me those little pieces, those little details bring a person to life and not just for my own family history but for everybody else that I encounter for their family history. I do get excited about what I'm finding for other people. If you're setting out on this journey, you are going to be the author of your family history. You know, your family history doesn't exist in a book that I can take off the shelf and say, well, here you go. I mean, it, it's the case for, for the, the kings and queens and lords and ladies, but not for most of us. So it becomes a really personal quest, I think, for people. You're finding people that have essentially been lost. You know, they're, they're in the records, but nobody knows they're there until you pluck them out and represent them in the context of your family history. So all of that, I think, makes it a very important and emotional journey for people um, and something that is their legacy.